Miami Sound need no introduction, so maybe I just stop here and give the stage to Sierra Alamunti. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My passion has been uh, edge cloud or cloud decentralization. And the reason uh, I chose that because a few years back we realized that uh, we're doing really well with uh, physical layer design, antenna design, or connectivity, but there was this huge issue uh, with the cloud itself and some of the choices that we had made very early on uh, about the architecture of the communication networks and the way uh, applications are brought into end users, whether for consumer or enterprise applications. With Edge, uh, there, there, there's a lot of confusion around the edge. Depending on uh, what industry you're with, uh, people's interpretation of where edge is, uh, is different. And this is, that's why I use this parable of the uh, blind man and an elephant. Uh, the story is, I'm sure that you've, uh, a lot of you have heard this story, that they bring a the, uh, few blind men and they... Uh, get them to touch various parts of the elephant to figure out what it is. Uh, the uh, man that uh, touches the trunk figures out that it may be a snake. The one that is touching the leg uh, uh, thinks that it's a tree stump. The one touching the ear thinks that it's a fan in the original story, but in here it says a sheet of leather. And uh, the one touching the tail figures out that this must be a mouse. And this is something that depending on what industry we come from, our outlook on different things and new things may, may differ uh, from each other. And that's what we see in our industry today. If you look at the telecommunication industry and uh, specifically cellular communications, those are, that are building equipment in that uh, industry think that perhaps Edge is the base station. The ones working on IoT figure out that the edge is an IoT hub. The ones that are building boxes and routers uh, call edge fog computing. And uh, those that are in the blockchain movement and decentralization and mesh technologies and uh, complete open peer-to-peer -peer, uh, call the edge perhaps uh, the mobile. So uh, in order to kind of rise above all the noise, we tried to define uh, edge in a, a simpler way. We looked at cloud, uh, in, and our company looked at cloud, uh, was very basic. We uh, uh, kind of uh, looked at what cloud had to offer. At the end of the day, cloud had to offer CPU, memory, and storage, and connectivity. So as you see, all of these elements, every device, has these elements, especially uh, the mobile phones today, perhaps are as powerful as uh, uh, some of the servers uh, just a few years back. And also, this will continue uh, with Moore's Law. As, as time goes by, these devices are going to become even more powerful. CPU, memory, and storage is gonna get cheaper. So any device could actually act as a cloud server. So when we talk about edge cloud, and it's in a scenario with if any device will participate in the network as a cloud server, we say that an edge cloud has been formed. So it's a very simple definition of uh, edge cloud. So why do we want to do this? Why, why edge cloud to start with? Uh, Central Cloud has been a, an amazing enabler for the app economy mobile internet. What basically drove it was to make sure that the cost of computing and the reachability of computing is there for developers to be able to build applications and make it available uh, to masses. When we started, uh, this was, as you know, internet was about us getting access to information that was over the web, right? So that uh, was the major reason for it. Uh, but today, after years 
of uh, uh, having the cloud, we're now uh, facing the challenges for the future. The first challenge of this is really the cost of cloud hosting, right? Uh, there was, when we talked about cost of cloud hosting a few years back, uh, it, there was a lot of pushback, especially, for instance, with Mimic when we were trying to do fundraising in, with, uh, with VCs in Silicon Valley. They said, well, what are you talking about? Cloud is cheap. And uh, it wasn't just until recently, and I think the first really big news was in 2017 uh, when Snap, uh, the company that provides the social media Snapchat, announced that they had made a $1 billion deal with AWS and a $2 billion deal for, with, with Google on cloud hosting services for five years. So talking about a company uh, spending $3 billion in uh, cloud hosting costs. So by no means cloud uh, is cheap. And there's recently also uh, Lyft announced that uh, for the next couple of years they'd be spending about $300 million in cloud hosting costs. Cloud is cheap as long as you don't use it that often, but if, you, if your application becomes very successful, then the cost of cloud can be a major uh, inhibitor. And uh, of course, uh, the other big problem of central cloud is uh, communications bandwidth and latency because the way it works is that the data has to travel from what we call client devices back to a server in data center that may be miles away. And because of uh, limitations of speed of light, obviously latency becomes an issue. And of course, these bits have to travel uh, uh, over the air or over uh, wired networks back to uh, servers in uh, data centers. And the other uh, big issue is, uh, of course, data privacy. Again, uh, if I tell you the story that a few years back, again, going to the VCs and talking about data privacy in Edge Cloud, the first response that we used to get was that nobody cares about privacy. And that was the case a few years back until uh, we realized what the uh, byproduct of this, uh, of sharing data with ter third parties can be with the fiasco with Facebook, uh, as you know, with uh, what happened in Egypt, uh, uh, the presidential elections in, in the US, we realized that if we make data available to people, they can uh, manipulate that data and drive us towards uh, end results that may not be very good for the, uh, for the population. So data privacy is also a big issue. The other issue is vendor lock-in. Now there's uh, basically uh, three companies that are controlling about 90% of the data uh, that we, con uh, we consume. These are uh, uh, cloud providers, uh, at least in North America and Europe. It's uh, really Amazon, uh, Google, and Microsoft. They're amazing companies. Uh, they have done a lot. But it uh, doesn't make sense for all our data to be controlled by, by three large companies. And of course, in, uh, in China, we have Alibaba, and there are others as well. So when they're locking, it's a big issue as well. There's too much power being concentrated in the hands of a few. And this thing is going to continue with uh, what I call a data tsunami. The, the Thing, the, the two uh, big uh, trends that make uh, the central crowd uh, a, a serious challenge for us uh, are one that we're all aware of, uh, which is the number of uh, devices. Uh, we're now hearing that 200 billion devices by just uh, next year. Uh, but most importantly, the way, the role of these devices has changed on the network. Uh, we used to use internet as a way of downloading information from a central place, but that role has changed from consumers of data uh, to producers of data. Uh, we're generating videos, uh, uh, pictures, uh, and also 
not that, that that's for the social media of course but also for uh, even industrial applications sensors cameras lidar all sorts of uh, information that is being produced on the edge of the network so the where the data is generated has completely changed so that means that the software architecture needs to be revisited. And uh, so uh, we, we have an architecture is from the days that we used to download information. Now we are uploading a lot of information. So how this software architecture needs to change. Uh, in order to uh, explain uh, the rationale of uh, Edge Cloud, why would we uh, want to use Edge Cloud in the first place? Edge Cloud is the right architecture for the future because, uh, first of all, it will uh, scale with devices. Today, with the, the current cloud architecture, if you add devices or client devices on the edge of the network, you have to add uh, more uh, servers uh, on the central cloud in order to support them. That's uh, how it works. With edge cloud, meaning if the devices can participate as servers, the cloud itself is going to get larger because now the computing resources on the edge are uh, being used uh, for cloud itself. It's faster. Uh, it's, uh, it's faster because of latency issues. So if you and I are in this room and we want to communicate and I can be a server to you, the data doesn't have to travel miles to a data center, so obviously the latency is lower. Uh, the bandwidth uh, usage is also lower. Uh, so also, it's cheaper because we don't hit Amazon, Google, and Microsoft's cloud services as often. Uh, we, we generally have much more uh, local communication. And uh, also, it has better data privacy because data can remain as local as it possibly can be. So if I can serve you a video from my own device, then the threat of privacy is much lower because I'm not sending the data to a third party and is less susceptible uh, to abuse. Last but not least is much more efficient, energy efficient uh, and bandwidth efficient uh, as, at, at a system level. In order to uh, kind of understand the future, sometimes it's good to look at the past uh, and see uh, where we have come from. Uh, in the early 60s to, to about 1980, we had mainframes. Unfortunately, I'm old enough uh, just to remember those days. That was really a central architecture. Then with the uh, PCs, we went to a decentralized architecture. Uh, if you remember, we used to put floppy disks and we would uh, load the software so the application would be loaded on the device and if we use it. So that would be a decentralized architecture. Then starting in the 90s, we went to a client server uh, architecture where we had uh, these uh, kind of thin clients from a computing and storage and memory point of view, where we're basically screens uh, that would uh, process information and the application would be uh, hosted uh, on, on central servers. And with central cloud, then, uh, uh, that architecture was evolved so that we could easily reach computing resources in servers in data centers. So again, that was uh, kind of a centralized architecture uh, of the cloud. And we're hoping that uh, 2019 onwards, uh, we, we're going to go back to a, a decentralized architecture again. And again, this is, I call it the pendulum because it's very analog. It's not black and white. Obviously, uh, throughout these years, we had variations of these technologies. But as we see it today, the dominant architecture today is, is uh, uh, central cloud. The other important thing to look at is actually how the software architecture has uh, evolved. And this is very important. In early days, where uh, uh, we, uh, we had the uh, client-server uh, architecture, generally a, a client uh, would be for rendering of information, and the application would be uh, on a, a server in a data center. And that application used to be monolithic. That means that it was basically a function in one big box, right? Uh, and there would be 
an API gateway perhaps in the middle, and of course you have the network as well. Then we move to the era of microservices. So these monolithic applications were broken into smaller pieces. So we uh, entered the era of app and services. So uh, about 20% of the businesses today have evolved to this microservice architecture. It's, uh, uh, it's something that it's now very common and everybody is talking about. But we have to also realize that 80% of our industry hasn't even got there yet, right? So the advantage of this is obviously if you want to make a change to your monolithic software architecture, it may take months or years to do this. When you have a, a microservice architecture, you can easily update various parts uh, uh, of your system. So if you see on the left hand, uh, we're showing the device. In the, uh, in the middle is the network. And then uh, on the right side, we have the cloud core. As communication engineers, we usually have never dabbled to uh, come and understand this API gateway and microservice. We really need to start thinking about this because communication has to be looked upon end to end in order to understand where you need to optimize and where you need to put some of your innovations in order to make sure that end to end you're getting the right result. So uh, the uh, other trend uh, was going from centralized uh, to distributed. So on the top picture that you, uh, you see the app and microservice, and then with the advent of virtualization and container technologies uh, such as Docker and CoreOS, some devices now have the capability to host microservices. For instance, now you can have a Docker container hosting a microservice on an x86 machine on a uh, regular uh, server, for instance. And uh, interestingly, the industry has come up with ideas as well to host microservices on typical network equipment. And that is something that in our circle of communication engineers, perhaps we're most familiar with in terms of edge. That's what we call edge. And that's uh, a standard that uh, was formed. The uh, name has changed to multi-access uh, uh, edge computing uh, today. And that means that you start hosting microservices on networking equipment. What does that mean? Uh, you know, we uh, have uh, all of this infrastructure like base stations and the core network and all of that. Now, the idea is that you put servers within the same infrastructure and start hosting what would, uh, what would be cloud uh, type uh, applications in, in terms of microservices. So that's what mobile edge uh, computing looks like. Now from a network architecture point of view, this is uh, what it looks like. So you've got devices and now imagine if we manage to host microservices on all the devices then uh, we can connect also so we have the cloud core and we have the devices talking to uh, the cloud. And this is happening today with, again, container technology and all of that. The next step to this is making sure that these devices can also act as servers to another. Right now, everything is managed through the cloud core. If you break that and now devices can communicate directly at a microservice level, then you get this massive cloud, which we would call edge cloud. So from a network architecture point of view, this is neither a star. So uh, this, this, would be, this would be the star, right? Uh, the, you, we've got a central element. Uh, if uh, you would have only those devices connected, that would be a mesh if you didn't have the cloud core. Now we have a hybrid architecture uh, where devices and the cloud core can join and uh, provide what we call edge cloud. Certain functions need to be centralized. 
functions such as registration, authentication, authorization, right? So when we talk about decentralization of the cloud, we're not talking about this in a religious way and say everything should be decentralized. What should be decentralized are those elements that are not necessary. So all unnecessary trust elements in a network should be removed because they add overhead in terms of latency, they uh, uh, create issues such as privacy, and that's why we have ended up where uh, we have ended up today, because we don't have a hybrid approach. So, what are the use cases for Edge Cloud? That's, again, you, you go and read about this, uh, and, and it's uh, very confusing. To me, it's very simple. Uh, Central Cloud is a special case of Edge Cloud. So all the applications that we see today that are being used with Central Cloud, all the use cases can be supported with Edge Cloud, right? Because in the worst case, you don't have Edge as a server, but you still have an Edge Cloud, right? So depending on what vertical you are, the benefits of Edge Cloud may vary. And the reason you use Edge Cloud may differ from one another. For instance, based on the uh, experiences now that we have had with some of our partners, for instance, in gaming, uh, the big driver for Edge Cloud is latency and also cloud hosting. For health and wellness is data privacy. It's one of the most perhaps uh, challenging things in the health industry in terms of having health information uh, being shared, uh, usually at least in Canada and the UK and US where I lived, every time I went to a doctor, I had to uh, tell my doctor exactly as it, it, it was as if it's the first time they see me. Nobody has any history information on me unless I have been going to that same doctor for years, right? So they ask you, they get you to fill out a form, uh, what kind of allergies you have, uh, you know, uh, what, what was, was the last surgery you had? And the reason for this is because of data privacy. These the different networks that are out there are not allowed to share your personal information. And it's for our protection, in fact. That's a funny thing. It's not, it's not a conspiracy to hide this information. It's for our protection. So the solution to that is that we need to be in control of our data and be able to share uh, that data. So in health, the driver for Edge Cloud is data privacy. In manufacturing, it may be hyper-local activity and the cost of cloud and the latency. For instance, if you want to have robots uh, uh, response uh, to commands based on some uh, uh, intelligence or AI, you want that to be local, so you need Edge Cloud and the driver for that may be latency. So all the use cases for Edge Cloud are going to be supported. And also then for enterprise, uh, that, as I said, only, and this, this was something that I, if you would have asked me, I would have guessed maybe 50%, but unfortunately only 20% of enterprises today are on their cloud journey. They're deciding whether to do uh, private cloud, public cloud, and now there's a great opportunity for enterprises to look at Edge Cloud uh, for the future. So they can jump into Edge Cloud uh, right off the bat. So you'll see a lot of activities in this domain, and that's why you're seeing these days a lot being writ written by cloud analysts and all of that on opportunities around edge cloud computing. So both for both consumer and enterprise applications, edge cloud is going to be a huge topic. The big question is how are we are gonna do this, right? And I'll take you through the story of how we came up with our idea of how to decentralize the cloud. And uh, we call that the principles of edge cloud or principles of cloud decentralization. When I use the principles of cloud decentralization, a lot of people from blockchain communities started uh, contacting me and telling me, oh, this is fantastic, we want to. And I, and I had to explain to them that my view on the decentralization is rather different from the 
uh, mainstream of the blockchain community. It, it says all, all, all trust elements have to be removed. Uh, what we believe is that there are trust elements that are necessary in the network for certain applications. So we're not as religious about this, so I call this now the principles of edge cloud so that it doesn't get confused. The first principle of edge cloud, we call it meritocracy. And that means that the role of a device on the network should be on, based on its merit. So, for instance, if a device has a lot of CPU and can run big AI algorithms, it should be assigned uh, to do it. We shouldn't have to uh, relegate that to a server in a data center. Or if a device has really good connectivity, may be used as proxy for connectivity to other devices. So meritocracy is a huge principle, is one of the fundamental principles of Edge Cloud. The issue is, to ensure that we can assign merit uh, to a device. So uh, there are challenges with that, obviously, but it's absolutely key to building a uh, edge cloud uh, system. The other is decentralized discovery. So one of the advantages that the uh, uh, servers in data centers have is that there's one uh, entity that is kind of controlling all of these devices, uh, they know exactly where they are. These devices are connected uh, with fiber and uh, ethernet. Uh, they're very reachable and they're very discoverable. When you talk about edge cloud, now you need uh, the ability for decentralized discovery. Because if you now relegate the discovery function to a, uh, uh, to a server in a data center, then you haven't done a very good job in decentralizing because now you, have, uh, you need another trust element in the cloud. And that you can see, for instance, with concepts such as presence servers, right? Or uh, 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 notification uh, services from the cloud to tell other devices uh, that I'm here. So decentralized discovery, the ability for devices to be able to discover one another in a decentralized fashion is key. And this needs to happen based on scope. And we came up with three scopes. Again, uh, there may be other scopes that are important, but when we looked at it, what, uh, we, we realized that uh, there are three elements that are really important. Being able to discover other nodes based on the network that they're on. For instance, what are the devices that are on, on my local Wi-Fi network, for instance? Proximity, what are the devices that are nearby uh, that I may be able to use as, uh, for Edge Cloud and connect to? And then uh, account, what are the device, uh, devices that are owned uh, uh, by Siavash or they're owned uh, by, uh, I don't know, IBM or Microsoft, uh, the enterprise, right? Uh, the account holder. So once you have these scopes, then you can do uh, the, the discovery based on uh, these scopes. The other important thing is clustering. Now this is very important because uh, the way we have uh, designed communications in the past is with scale in mind, the, you know, millions of devices connected to the network and then managing them. But the reality is most of the communication happens in very small clusters. In fact, uh, in, in the uh, in my first talk that I gave on uh, decentralization a couple of years back, uh, that I talked about uh, Professor Dunbar out of Oxford. They came up with something called the Dunbar number. So he's an anthropologist uh, and uh, came up with the Dunbar number, which is 150. And that's the maximum number of close connections uh, that we can have. And I really wish that they would have taught us when I was going to school. I think that some of the schools have started uh, now for communication theory uh, teaching uh, uh, the Dunbar number. But that, that is a big piece of information because it says that at most in my lifetime I can ha have 150 close collections. That means on a daily basis my communication perhaps is limited to a cluster with just a few individuals, right? So I need to manage the communication on a cluster basis and not have to think that one device needs to talk uh, to, to millions of other devices, right? So clustering, again, based on scope, is uh, one of the other principles 
uh, of Edge Cloud. The other important thing is microservice communication, uh, meaning, again, that uh, microservices are generally programs that are uh, run on the back end to provide a service to an application. So to decentralize the cloud, a device needs to be able to act as a server. That means that it needs to be able to host the microservice, right? So any device should be able to support uh, microservices in order to communicate by, uh, with another device. And that's what we call microservice communication. If you don't do this, then you end up, end up again with the central cloud architecture because that's where the microservices are hosted today. The other important thing is collaboration. To make the system-wide edge cloud efficient, it's important that these devices be able to uh, collaborate. So uh, uh, a good example with the scope of accounts. Silvash has uh, a mobile phone. I have uh, game players. I have a couple of PCs at home. I have a smart uh, TV and all of that. Now these devices have all computing power and CPU and memory, and uh, some of them may have really good connection. Uh, uh, for instance, when I uh, buy my new iPhone, uh, uh, instead of having to go and uh, pay another two or $300 for extra memory, what if I could uh, use the memory that is in my NAS, right? So if these devices can uh, uh, collaborate and share resources, then you're gonna have at a system-wide a much more efficient uh, uh, system. The other important thing is dynamic resource instantiation. And uh, for us as engineers, there are two important things. One, one is the signaling, and the other thing is data bearer, right? Now, when you have a decentralized system like that, if you start assigning fixed resources to these nodes, it's not scalable, right? Because now you have to, it's, it's a scalable to, uh, uh, connect a few devices and give them signaling and data bearer resources within a, uh, for example, cell with a base station and a few devices that are active. But when you talk about decentralized cloud, but there's 200 billions of devices and anyone may talk to another, to have signaling and data bearer in a fixed way assigned, uh, it's just not feasible. So uh, resources need to be assigned dynamically. So for instance, if I don't have an IP address and I need to be reachable, I need to go to a proxy and be able to connect, the signaling channel needs to be assigned at the time that I need it. Not before, not after, right? So that's what we call a dynamic uh, resource instantiation. Last but not least is independence. And that comes from being pragmatic, right? If, uh, uh, now, today we were struggling, uh, we were a little bit late in doing the presentation because we were struggling to get my Mac to talk to the uh, uh, projector and all sorts of issues with uh, fragmentation in operating systems and all of that. And that's, uh, uh, if, if you want to de for devices to be able to communicate at microservice level, it has to be independent of operating system it has to be independent of the networks that they're on, and it has to be independent of the location and proximity uh, of devices. Agnosticism, I, I can't, it was, it was such a hard thing uh, to say, to be agnostic to all of these things. And, and this is really important because if you're not agnostic, then you uh, end up with things such as DLNA. I never got anywhere because it had to be supported across different operating systems. It had to be supported across every network. So every what new Wi-Fi standard had to put something, every new uh, cellular standard need, needed uh, provisions for this. And so all of these things need to be independent, which when you say, when you have this principle of independence, then you end up that actually this communication network between these nodes has, has to happen at the application level from the OSI layer stack, the only <laughs> way to make these things independent to operating systems and networks is to do things at the application level. Challenges of it, Edge Cloud. So uh, it, it, it took us 
10 years uh, to, uh, to create the system that we have today because there are a lot of challenging things to do. Uh, device and network fragmentation is uh, very, very important to have, for instance, an iOS device talking to an Android device, to have a Windows device talking to a Mac at a microservice level it's, it's, it's quite a challenge because they, they're not built to be able to communicate at that level today. The other important thing uh, is increased uh, uplink traffic. And I've tried to illustrate this uh, in an example of, for instance, if I want to share a video with three people. Using Central Cloud today, I do one upload and I put it on Facebook, for instance, or Dropbox or whatever that trust entity in the cloud is. And then there are three downlinks uh, of the video uh, from my friends. If I want to do this in a decentralized fashion, then I would have three uplinks. And as you guys know, uh, both in wired networks and wireless networks today, we have a fairly uh, uh, asymmetric network where downlink resources are more than uplink resources. So we need to make sure for the future that these networks become more, more symmetric. And a big driver for that is the fact that we are producing more content down there at the edge than we produce uh, in the central cloud. So we as uh, consumers and also sensors and machines generate uh, millions of times more data. Therefore, these networks need to become uh, symmetric uh, for the future. So this is something that needs to happen anyway. It's a challenge that will be overcome uh, in 5G, hopefully. The other important challenge is non-persistent devices, right? Uh, the uh, cloud vendors in central cloud, they have complete control uh, over their servers. Uh, apart from uh, certain anomalies, uh, servers uh, going down uh, because of hardware issues or connectivity breakdown, uh, generally speaking, uh, servers are uh, very persistent. Whereas when you talk about edge cloud, you're dealing with these non-persistent nodes that are coming and going. So if you want to treat them as cloud servers, you have to be able to deal with this uh, non-persistency. So. I said we have a pragmatic uh, approach to edge cloud. So how did we at Mimic uh, come up uh, with the solution around this? So, and it has been, it wasn't something that, you know, we, uh, we thought about uh, day one and said this is, the, this is the architecture and exactly was the way it was. We had to really uh, evolve, iterate to get to the uh, to where we are, and that's why it's taken us close to 10 years to complete it. The first thing, something called the Edge SDK. So we came up with a piece of software at the application level that you can put it on a device, and you can have that device to act as a cloud server when needed, right? Uh, we used to say turn a device into a cloud server, but that's not correct. The key thing is the ability for a device to act as a server, you know? And at the same time, be able to act as a client because that's how things work. When I want to communicate something with you, I am the server. When you communicate to me, you are the server, right? So that role needs to be assigned uh, dynamically. So with this piece of software, we made sure now the device has the ability to act as server uh, where it's needed. So that means the device can host a microservice, right? It has a web server. It has all the elements, such as an API gateway. And I'll show a few diagrams to make that clear. I know it's, it's a little bit hard, uh, perhaps, if you uh, don't have that software uh, background to kind of understand this. So I've tried to uh, draw some pictures and make it more clear. But a very high level picture currently is that, that the cloud is in the middle and all the devices are uh, connecting to it and they talk generally through that cloud server. So uh, uh, whether uh, it's a Facebook application uh, or uh, whatever uh, application that you're using, uh, that's uh, the picture on the left. When you put 
the edge SDK on the devices on the edge of the network, you create kind of a mesh that includes the, the central cloud itself. So the hybrid architecture of the cloud that I was uh, talking about. But then you need certain functions. You need these devices to be able to register, authorize, authenticate. So you need a backend. So that's what we call the edge backend, right? So these are the two elements together that we now enable devices to act as cloud servers and together join uh, and create an edge cloud. So let me show you so that uh, uh, it becomes a little more clear now. If you look at client-to-client -client communication today with central cloud, generally you have the client application being hosted on the device. If it wants to communicate to another device, it sends a uh, message to the API gateway, API gateway, uh, looks at what microservice is needed, and generally it will go to a push notification service that says, hey, th another device wants to talk to you, right? And obviously that device through a presence server has pinged that said that I'm here, so there was a bunch of stuff that was done in, uh, before that, and then the communication happens. It's like it takes uh, multiple messages and pings uh, back and forth uh, to do this. And the reason for that is that the API gateways and microservices are only in servers in data centers. And if you do this in a uh, decentralized fashion, now you have the Edge SDK, you can host microservices on the devices themselves, you have an API gateway right on the device, and the client application, the first thing it's going to do is actually uh, talk to its own API gateway and try to, uh, if there's an HTTP request, to do it uh, locally. So it, it's important, and in the hybrid architecture, it can also do this with the cloud, because some of the functions may need the cloud, right? So if the device, it makes sense to do a microservice level communication by another device in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion, it does it. If it needs to go through the cloud for some reason, it should be able to do that as well. So that's what we have. We have the Edge SDK, and then we have a cloud backend that do, does signaling services. For instance, if one device is behind the uh, firewall, you need to find a proxy and make, make communication possible so that the device is reachable, you need registration, you need authentication, you need multiple levels of security in order to make sure that Edge Cloud is private uh, and secure. So the key aspect of this is that the Edge nodes can now communicate directly, right, or through the cloud, and also that uh, servers in data centers uh, are still being used to manage uh, communication. Now, when the edge cloud gets bigger, the reliance on these uh, uh, servers in data centers may uh, become less and less, right? But at the same time, uh, the number of devices are going up, the number of applications are going up, and uh, I, I, won't, I don't envision a day that we're going to completely eliminate boxes that are only have uh, server functionality, whether that's a fog computing uh, node or a uh, base station using MEC or a server in a data center. So it's going to be variations uh, of uh, these devices on the cloud uh, serving. So by no means take me wrong that I say uh, f uh, fog computing is need not needed, uh, MEC is not uh, helpful, or the servers in the data centers are not there. But we have a gap, and the gap is that the device itself has to be able to uh, act as a server. And that's what we have tried to uh, accommodate. So to conclude, uh, now, what are the benefits uh, when, you, when you do this? So privacy uh, is ensured because now uh, the data remains as local as it can be. So just imagine as a consumer now, if I have videos or photos or music or whatever that I can share with my friends, I have a choice to have those on, on my device and serve it to my friends. Right? I, I doubt that I am going to require a CDN for that because of the Dunbar number and Dunbar principle, because 
uh, unless I become a celebrity and everybody wants to connect with me, uh, I'll be just doing things uh, in a cluster of very small uh, nodes. So I'll be able to serve that myself. That means my data is going to uh, remain private. My health data can be uh, on a device that I own, and nobody from a regulation perspective can stop me from sharing that with, uh, with doctors. Right? Because that's the only way to overcome all the regulations. Uh, the reason doctors do not share your personal data is because they have to get your consent, and that takes days. You know, I, I don't know whether you've gone through that. I've tried that. I went to my doctor and said, okay, fill out this form, uh, and then the form is sent to somebody else, and then uh, three, day, three days later it gets signed. And a lot of it has to do with regulations, right? Regulations, uh, and, and it's... And, and they're there for a reason. These are not outdated things, because uh, if, if they don't do that, it may be abuse, and also there may be all sorts of legal lawsuits. So if I now have my personal health data on my device, and I can serve it, then uh, no, nobody, can, nobody can stop that, and nobody has a problem with it, in fact. Right? And the doctors will be happy, the, uh, the information from my health record is there, and I'm going to receive better, better health services. So uh, privacy is obviously uh, uh, a, a big benefit of this edge cloud. The cost of cloud hosting, the reachability of computing, is there for developers to be able to build applications and make it available uh, to masses. By no means cloud uh, is cheap. Cloud is cheap as long as you don't use it that often, but if, you, if your application becomes very successful, then the cost of cloud can be a major uh, inhibitor. It's cheaper because we don't hit Amazon, Google, and Microsoft's cloud services as often. Uh, we, we generally have much more uh, local communication. Then uh, latency, bandwidth and all of that. And these are things that, you know, from a coming uh, from a background of communication theory, I wish I would have had the uh, uh, time to be able to put an analytic framework for quantifying all of these gains. But it's very obvious when you uh, hyper-localize communication, you reduce latency and you uh, improve uh, bandwidth efficiency. Uh, vendor locking uh, is not an issue anymore because it's, it's a much more open platform. I mean, you can have an iOS device talking to Android, to Windows and Mac. You've created an open, open platform by nature, right? Uh, so uh, now you will be able to have the ability to choose uh, Amazon or um, uh, Microsoft or cloud as your cloud vendor and be able to uh, communicate communicate across different cloud vendor nodes. You can communicate across different operating systems, whether it's in Windows or Mac. Uh, the other uh, important benefit is that now uh, the developers that are doing, doing the software development can do their job much easier because now they can uh, build a solution, a microservice, and be able to host that on various devices instead of having to uh, rely on third-party resources uh, in order uh, uh, to do that. The benefits uh, to, uh, to the user are also uh, significant, uh, not just from the perspective uh, of uh, 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 data privacy, uh, but from all aspects. When the cloud hosting cost goes down, right, at the end of the day, we as consumers and enterprises, we pay for that price. So we'll take benefit from the fact that these uh, services have a much lower cost. Uh, we have much more control over uh, our data, right? And uh, uh, it, it's much uh, less susceptible uh, to abuse third parties. At the end of the day, we're going to have a cloud that is cheaper, faster, and more private and more open. So that's why we should be doing uh, edge cloud computing in the future. So that concludes my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>